Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, June 15th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, Donald Trump and the NRA might be planning a stealth gun ban, which will add millions of Americans on the terror watch list. Meanwhile, an Islamic refugee is arrested on the New Mexico border in possession of the region's gas pipeline plans. Then, what would Jesus do at the gay bar shooting in Orlando? Plus, creeps in space. NASA wants to put human clones on a Mars colony, and they're ready to use crony capitalism to get them there. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, what is the lesson that we need to learn from this Orlando shooting by this Islamic who appears to be a homosexual? So many different angles to this, but what is the issue? Well, the issue that everybody is seizing on is gun control. The real issue has to be border patrol. And there are signs that Donald Trump certainly understands that. He's been pushing that narrative, but there's also signs that he is starting to slip. He's starting to slip into the gun control camp along with the NRA. Is this something that is going to be uh, unlike all others? I believe it will be. We have a Reuters editorial that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. They say this event is going to be different because it's activated the LGBT lobby, a very powerful lobby. And it also speaks to what conservatives say they want, which is national security. They worship at the altar of that false god. Will they sacrifice our gun rights to it without us really realizing it? Now, first, let's talk about what the real narrative is. We've got a story here as uh, people are pushing back on Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina. He is the Senate Intelligence Chairman. He defended Trump, but he argues that a Muslim ban is not on the table. Uh, he is chairman of the U.S. Intellig Senate Intelligence Committee. He says that uh, GOP nominee Donald Trump is calling for a temporary pause and not a ban on Muslims entering the country. He said in his speech, listen to it, he did not say ban, okay? He spoke with a handful of uh, reporters yesterday. He said there's a big difference between a ban and what he said. He said he called for a pause. Now, this is while Paul Ryan is repeatedly saying that Donald Trump is calling for a ban, calling for a ban. And of course, we've got uh, Burr saying, I'm telling you what I read in his speech. You can spin it however you want. I heard the speech. He talked about a pause. He did not talk about a ban. Now, that's very true. Conservative uh, commentator Hugh Hewitt, who I don't trust. The man is a hardcore neocon, never Trumper, uh, open borders, the rest of the stuff. This guy is now saying, well, I think uh, Richard Burr would be a great Senate candidate or vice president candidate for uh, Donald Trump. Let me tell you something. If Richard Burr, I know Richard Burr, I'm from North Carolina. If Richard Burr becomes the vice presidential candidate, I'd really have to seriously think about whether I would set this election out or not. Because he is cut from the same stuff as Jeb Bush, as Lindsey Graham. He's a very dangerous person. He doesn't respect any of our rights. And even though he is correcting what Paul Ryan is saying, he is still very dangerous. Now, it truly is about the border. As I've said before, what difference does it make if you're going to have gun control if you let terrorists into the country? They can get nuclear, biological, chemical weapons. They can create bombs. They can even kill people with knives, as we saw in uh, France, in Paris. You had a police commander and his wife executed in front of their three-year-old child as he held them hostage and put the videos out on Facebook with a knife, with a knife, not with a gun. And then take a look at this from Judicial Watch. An Islamic refugee with gas pipeline plans. See, they don't even need to have a bomb or nuclear or biological chemical. They just need some plans and something they can blow up. An Islamic refugee, quote unquote, with gas pipeline plans has been arrested in New Mexico border county. Police in a U.S. town bordering Mexico have apprehended an undocumented Middle Eastern woman in possession of the region's gas pipeline plans, say law enforcement sources. They told that to Judicial Watch. And of course, Judicial Watch has broken a number of stories in the last few years about Mexican drug traffickers smuggling Islamic terrorists into the United States through porous southern border. You see, if you let a terrorist in, they'll find anything including our gas pipelines, to attack us with. The issue is controlling the borders. If you can't control the borders, if you won't do background checks on people when they come into the country, what makes you think they're going to be able to or willing to do background checks on people once they're in the country? 
None of these things, nuclear, biological, chemical, gas pipelines, all those things have the potential to be far more dangerous than a single rifle or even multiple rifles. At the same time, we have a Reuters commentary uh, where they say Sandy Hook didn't change our gun laws, but the Orlando shooting might. They say the Orlando shooting is different from all the attacks that we've seen in Brussels, Paris, San Bernardino, different from Sandy Hook and all these other places that they list. They say the difference is because now there's an alliance between gun regulation and the LGBT advocacy groups, the very well-organized social movement. Nobody has more money, nobody has more clout, really, quite frankly. We're we'll talking about the NRA, let's talk about the LGBT. They have a tremendous amount of power. They're a very politically lucrative group, and they are going to be coming for the guns. And then they point out, and further in this editorial, they say one of the most controversial breaches of fundamental constitutional rights permitted the National Security Agency to turn its signal interception inward to spy on all American people without obtaining legal warrants. Yeah, that's the FISA Star Chamber. He says, public calls to regulate firearms for national security reasons and possibly save more American lives despite Second Amendment rights should not come as a surprise. To improve homeland security, the argument goes, U.S. citizens would be better protected if more restrictive background checks were performed, if people were required to prove good character. This could include not belonging to any group prohibited from owning firearms. So he lists a few groups that we would do right now, like the mentally ill, people who are labeled as terrorists by our government. This is something that Barack Obama and Donald Trump agree on. It's something that Jay Johnson, head of Homeland Security, as well as the NRA, agree on. And they are pushing the narrative of national security, as I pointed out, that false god that they worship, that they sacrifice all of our freedoms to for the mere promise of safety, and we will not get that. And of course, immediately after this happened, Piers Morgan goes on Daily Mail. Of course, Piers Morgan is a friend of Donald Trump. He won The Apprentice uh, one year. And uh, he supports Donald Trump in everything he says except in guns. And he writes this editorial headline, we've had a no-fly list for suspected terrorists for years, so why, a, why not a no-buy list? It's time for Trump and the NRA to show whose side they're really on. And unfortunately, it sounds like Donald Trump is listening to that. It sounds like the NRA is listening to that. We have reports, and of course, uh, this has come out via Twitter, which is where Donald Trump makes his announcements. I'll be meeting with the NRA, he says, who have endorsed me about not allowing people on the terrorist watch list or the no-fly list to buy guns. And then the NRA comes back and says, happy to meet Donald Trump. Our position is no guns for terrorists, period. Due process and right to self-defense for law-abiding Americans. Oh, let me ask you this. How do you not have, if you're going to be a law-abiding American, Okay, only law-abiding Americans get due process. But then who determines if you don't have due process for everyone, not just law-abiding citizens, if the mere accusation of being a lawbreaker, if the mere accusation of being a terrorist is enough to take away your right to due process, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything, does it? The NRA says they support due process for law-abiding Americans. Donald Trump says he's going to take away guns from people who are on the no-fly list. The first story I covered when I came here to InfoWars was about a man who was on his way to see his wife who was in the military in Japan. As he flew from California to Hawaii, changed, plans, uh, changed planes, got on uh, another plane to go, the second leg of the trip. They stopped the plane as it was about to take off, came on and drug him off the plane and said, you're on a no-fly list, you can't fly. And of course, he's in Hawaii. How does he get anywhere without flying? How did I get on this list? He's somebody who was vetted by the TSA. He had an airport worker's license. He had, had a background check for that. He had multiple background checks for firearms. And yet, he could not find out who had put him on this super secret watch list, this no-fly list. And all the time that we were reporting on it, they absolutely refused to tell him what he was charged with. They refused to tell him how he could get off of that list. That is the issue, folks. That is the fundamental issue. Most of the Bill of Rights was written as a reaction to the star chamber that they had in England, a secret court that could charge you and try you without you knowing what you were charged with, without you being able to answer to those charges, present a defense to those charges, without you being able to have a jury of your peers present to judge whether or not you were guilty of those charges. Now we've got people on the left and the right, the NRA and Obama, all saying we need to take away 
the firearms from people who are merely accused of being terrorists. There is no due process in that. There is no due. Here's a statement from the NRA. The NRA believes that terrorists should not be allowed to purchase or possess firearms, period. Well, of course. But have due process before you become a terrorist. You don't become a terrorist by accusation, only by due process. They say, go on to say, anyone on a terror watch list who tries to buy a gun should be thoroughly investigated by the FBI and the sale delayed while the investigation is ongoing. If an investigation uncovers evidence of terrorist activity or involvement, the government should be allowed to immediately go to court, block the sale, and arrest the terrorist. Hey, you know what? They got the order wrong, okay? First of all, you would investigate, then you would charge and indict and, in, and arrest the person. That would stop the danger right there if you arrest them, charge and indict them. And then you would have a trial by jury of their peers. But they say, no, you go to court and then you uh, block the sale and then you arrest the terrorist, okay? The order is wrong. They also say, at the same time, due process protection should be put in place that allow law-abiding Americans who are wrongly put on a watch list to be removed. Well, how do you know you're on the watch list until you start to suffer the penalties from that? Until you're banned from traveling? Until you are banned from owning a gun? And we have to understand, folks, that it isn't just going to be airplanes. It isn't going to be but just a few years before the government will have control over all ground transportation as well. They're going to have a transportation grid, an information highway, aut autonomous cars, they'll be able to stop and block your car from being able to go anywhere if we allow this to continue. You have to understand where this is going. And of course, this is a reaction to a law that was put out uh, earlier by Representative uh, Peter King, a Republican, a neocon extraordinaire, and he tried to put this in back in 2015, uh, which would basically give the Attorney General the right to just take away anybody's freedoms, anybody's basic rights. Now, we've had uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary Jay Johnson. We have an article on Infowars.com from Daily Caller. They point out, interestingly enough, that he now sees right-wingers as those who pose the same threat as Islamic terrorists. And we've told you this all along. This is really for conservatives, for people who are right-wingers. They continually say they're more concerned about conservative extremists than they are about Islamic extremists. And guess what? This is our own chief of police here in Austin, Art Acevedo. They reported in the story as the uh, city of Austin mayor. No, he's not the mayor. He's the chief of police. They say the minutes show that he shifted the discussion to the threat of right-wing extremists, according to the official uh, minutes. Member Acevedo reminded the council that the threat from right-wing extremists domestically is just as real as the threat from Islamic extremism. And Secretary Jay Johnson agreed and noted that their committee combating violent extremism, by definition, is not solely focused on just one religion. Yeah, it's for all of you folks. And then take a look at what this retailer is doing secretly. We have a story from Kit Daniels on Infowars.com. Academy, major retailer here in the Southwest and other parts of the country, report uh, is creating a database for ammunition purchases and is pulling semi-automatic rifles from the shelves. Academy Sports and Outdoors is gathering personal data on customers who buy more than 10 boxes of so-called assault rifle caliber ammunition. It's also pulling rifles from store shelves in support of the Obama administration agenda. Additionally, Academy is pulling anything that resembles a sporting rifle, including rifle-shaped BB gun, uh, barbecue lighters, and airsoft rifles, like BB guns, okay, from store displays. Although another employer uh, employee revealed semi-automatic rifles will still be sold upon request. Another one says, well, they're still going to be for sale. And remember, we did this before when there was a uh, mass shooting. Uh, we pulled them after Sandy Hook for a week or two. I would expect to see them uh, come back out after a couple weeks. Kit Daniels points out that the FBI's own data reveals that in 2014, less than 250 murders out of 12,000, about 2% were committed with rifles of any type. And that would include the vaguely defined assault rifle. Now, We've seen the editorial from the uh, man who says that it's time to repeal the Second Amendment, writing for the Rolling Stone. He says the Constitution is just simply wrong. We need to make sure that this is repealed. He offers us the outdated argument that when the Second Amendment was put in, we only had muzzle rifles. Let me remind you that we have more people buried in graves in America that were killed with black powder rifles than with anything else. They're very deadly. They were state-of-the-art military weapons. And he says, well... You know, we, the founders didn't have to weigh the risks of one man killing 49 people. No, they put in the Second Amendment because they knew that one man, a king or a president, could kill millions of people. 
could kill millions of people to further his agenda. The Second Amendment is a check on government power, first and foremost. Secondly, it affirms our God-given right of self-defense. And that is not something that we are willing to give up. He said, liberty is not just a one-way street. You have a right to walk around and not be killed. We've had Obama talk about how it's so easy to get guns. And let me say to the people on the left, many of you understand the futility of the war on drugs. You understand that for 45 years, we've had a war on drugs, and we've had draconian measures of throwing people in jail uh, for a very long time. It has had absolutely no effect. You can still go on school, camp, uh, school campuses and you can buy drugs very easily. They're readily available. Do you think draconian laws to try to control guns are going to do anything other than make them more lethal, just as they've made drugs more lethal? Of course, they're not going to. And he asks, finally, in his misguided editorial, he says, well, what if there'd been people carrying guns? What if people just started shooting in the dark in every direction? Wouldn't there have been more people killed? No, we've talked about this as well. We've talked about the many different episodes where in less than three minutes, somebody goes on a shooting spree and someone with a gun takes them out. Instead of people bleeding out on the floor, dying, waiting three hours for the police to make a move. People who were shot early on, many of them would have survived, except they bled out on the floor as the police were waiting outside. Now, at the same time, all this is going on. To pull this all together, you need to understand that we have a filibuster that's going on today by Democrats in the Senate. Senator Chris Murphy of uh, Connecticut has launched a filibuster on the Senate floor arguing that he wants, guess what? Suspected terrorists to be barred from purchasing firearms. You see where this is all going? All of these threads are pulling together. And what they're going to do is they're going to take a star chamber purchase, uh, process and use that to block purchases. We should all be very afraid of these watch lists. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Now, we've been told by Imam Obama that these people, that's the man who did this in Orlando, was a homegrown terrorist. And of course, the greatest threat to us are homegrown terrorists. Is this really true, Leanne? Well, a lot of people are trying to make that claim, especially with Donald Trump's uh, national security speech, saying, you know, this was, he was a, a New Yorker, this was a native ideology here. But we're going to take a closer look and see that this was actually an imported ideology. That's right. Now, he was, of course, one of these people radicalized online in addition to what he was getting taught at home by his father, who is from Afghanistan. We'll get into him a little bit uh, later. But last night, he, this, uh, the radical Muslim cleric who is connected to the Orlando terrorists, he had an interview with Greta Van Suster, and it was very eye-opening, a very interesting peek into a a lauded Islamic scholar. So this is someone who travels around the world, goes to universities, and speaks about his version of Islam. So this is one of the clips that's really making the round today, making all the headlines. Uh, what he had to say about a Hillary Clinton presidency. Hillary Clinton, as a Muslim, I object to Hillary Clinton. No, I don't believe a woman should be the president of, of a nation. As our Prophet Sallallahu he taught us that whenever a woman is in charge, there's going to be problems. What if she's on her menses and it's time to go to war? She's going to press the button because she's angry? You know? Uh-uh. I don't believe that she should be put in that position. You know, we're still debating whether a woman should be in the battlefield with men. And we're going to make a woman a president? Well, it's a good thing he didn't say that to Megyn Kelly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so obviously, you know, just your basic science, I'm pretty sure Hillary Clinton is a little bit too old to be having her period. But, I mean, what century is this? Should we just send her into the middle of the woods with the other women on their moon cycle? Uh, but then he goes on to talk about stoning women to death. And is this an appropriate uh, rebuke for people who are committing adultery? No, I do not condemn that. Why not? Do you condemn someone getting to electric chair for whatever crime they get the electric chair for? So you think adultery for a woman is a I, death penalty offense? Not just a woman. Why do you want to specify a woman? Because, that's, because I see the women being stoned to death and I don't see the men. Are they stoning oh, okay. the men to death? Well, I, are I, they? I don't know. What, uh, what I them is the concept that stoning is an is an inappropriate punishment for adultery because we find in the Quran and in the Sunnah that we stone for a person who is an adulterer. So, you know, she I mean, I have to applaud Greta because she just sat there and allowed him to speak and reveal a Muslim ideology. Yeah. Yeah. OK, this is right. moderate. And 99 percent of, of Muslims in Afghanistan, other they agree with Sharia law. Like the video that we had up on the uh, Paul Joseph Watson uh, that, that we played earlier today, and like our guests also said, 
uh, where he disagrees with Donald Trump is the term radical Islam. Mm -hmm. This is what characterizes mainstream Islam. Well, and you know, he's probably golf buddies with Obama because he sort of had the same response when Greta asked him about journalists being beheaded by ISIS. So when they behead uh, James Foley, uh, a journalist, your thought is what? I believe some journalists need to be beheaded, but I wouldn't have done that. You believe okay. some journalists need to be beheaded? I only say that facetiously. Okay. In that, in, 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 in a so way. how do you how do you just how do you in any way how can you in any way uh, justify ISIS? I'm not justifying. Okay. I'm not justifying. I was I was just saying that you know no I don't justify any of their activities and no I don't think that I so should. So should should so shouldn't we stop them? No. So he walks it back a little bit, but he's obviously not saying it facetiously. He just knows this is Takia. This is uh, this is that. Just joking. They know that if they're going to be facing prosecution, they are allowed to lie to the infidel. They can lie to us. And he says he doesn't think it's right that the United States should be trying to stop ISIS. Uh, no, he doesn't. And then she also asked him, you know, about Mateen's association uh, with the American suicide bomber. And he says, well, I personally don't believe that all those guys are suicide bombing. So, I mean, this is someone who is making excuses. But let's take a look. Who is this guy? So he is, was just released from prison last year. He was a former U.S. Marine, uh, discharged in 1990. Um, he was disenchanted with the military. So what does he do? Immediately becomes a leader of a gang. And so the gang robbed more than 10 banks, private homes, post offices at gunpoint, shot three police officers, and attacked one cop after he was injured by a homemade pipe bomb, and then he was arrested in 1991. So in in one year, after disenchanted with how bad the military is, he becomes this gang leader, and then so the prosecutors cut a deal with him that he only had to serve four years in prison, but he had to work undercover for the FBI between 2004 and 07, documenting terrorist plans and networks in Africa, Egypt, and the U.S. So he goes undercover and. Now he's running a, a Muslim ex extremist Islamic school. So he basically goes to these places and get, gets even more radicalized. Timbuktu Academy. Yeah. yeah, he was able to convert 36 other people while he was in jail, uh, you know, converted them to his teachings. And so, like I said earlier, he travels the world, uh, going to universities, some of them here in the United States. And he also has ties to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He was the bodyguard for uh, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. So, I mean, talk We've about- We've seen this a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, does this characterize Islam? Well, you know, Muslims need to speak out about it. They need to say, they need to disassociate themselves from that. We've seen some Christians who have been accused of supporting this, and we've seen some very hateful things from some individual pastors. I want to take a look at that real quickly. We've had uh, one Baptist pastor who's spoke back against this. We had Carl Gallups. He said he reacted with outrage. Uh, this is a WND story. Uh, by attempts by the ACLU staffers to pin the blame on the massacre of homosexuals on Christians. He says the idea of somehow celebrating or condoning this violence, says this Baptist pastor, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be more disgusting for me to contemplate. This is an insult to all Christians. He says, I am not a hater of people. I don't think other Christians are as well. Speaking for myself, I've dedicated 40 years of my adult life to serving, ministering to the deep needs of people of all races, sexual preferences, and religious preferences. At the same time, we see another couple of pastors who've gotten a lot of press. Uh, Pastor Roger Jimenez of the Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento uh, says that Orlando is now safer. He says, are you sad that 50 pedophiles were killed today? He said, no, I think that's great. I think it helps society. I think Orlando, Florida is a little safer tonight. Another pastor, uh, Tempe, Arizona, yeah. Stephen Anderson, uh, said there are 50 less pedophiles in this world, also from another Baptist church. Now, people need to understand there's probably as many different flavors of Baptist churches as there are uh, variations of Islam, okay? Mm -hmm. This guy said, uh, Religious Stephen Anderson, extremism. yeah, he said uh, LGBT people should be executed by a righteous government. That's the only problem that he had with it. Mm. And so, you know, when I look at this, I have to say, that this is not Christianity. I have to speak out, I'm a Christian. I don't want people who are not Christians to think that this is what Christianity is about. I don't want Christians to be fooled by some of these false teachers to think that that's what Christianity is about. Seriously, folks, where do you think, uh, what, would have Je what would Jesus have done? You know, we've got these little things you find at the uh, Baptist bookstores, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Thinking about what would Jesus do in this situation or that situation?
What would Jesus do at a gay bar that was being, where there was shooting going on? Would he even be at a gay bar? I think yes. He was accused by the Pharisees of being in the company with sinners, prostitutes, publicans, tax collectors. <laughs> That's really <laughs> bad people. He was accused of that, and he didn't deny it. He said he came to this world to save sinners. He didn't come here to tell Christians that your duty on earth is to kill people who are sinners. No, Jesus came to die for sinners. That's Christianity. That's what we need to understand. That's the difference between people who are willing to die for what they witnessed, that's what martyr really originally meant, versus people who want to kill others and are willing to die to kill people who they think are doing something wrong. That's the difference, and we need to make that clear in all religions. Yeah, that's good for you to make that point. All right, we're gonna be right back. Stay with us. Why would, you, why, because why, why, they're why, beheading people, beheading Americans? Okay, we're, we don't we have our own problems here? Yeah, we got problems here, but okay. I mean, so, is it our business? Well, apparently, it's some of those problems are being imported here. Only because I think I think that because we feed into this and we grow it here. Kari Jackson, out here at the Trump event in Atlanta, Georgia, outside the Fox Theater. Uh, what you can see behind me is what remains of the demonstrators. And obviously, the thing's over now. It's raining horribly. The rally started off rather peaceful, pretty much benign. I talked to a, a few people, saw some arguments, put those up. But by and large, it was pretty peaceful until I guess maybe an hour or so before the event actually ended. And then uh, the Trump supporters started to trickle out. When they came out, they encountered the anti-Trump demonstrators. Now, every time a fight happened, I wasn't right there. I had to run up to it, so I can't say who started what. But it's over now, and like I said, the crowd has uh, greatly dissipated, so I'll probably get out of here pretty soon soaking wet and uh, bring you more reports on Infowars.com. One week from tomorrow, Britain will vote as to whether or not they will leave the European Union, the Brexit vote. Now, this is a vote that is not important only for England or Britain. This is a vote that is important for the entire world because this is a referendum on global governance. You have to understand the European Union is part of the transitional plan to global governance. And as the globalists are moving with these trans-Pacific and transatlantic partnerships to join North America to Europe, to join North America to Asia, to create a global trading bloc as part of the transitional process to world governance, because after economic union comes political union, as they're moving to the next level, it could possibly be unraveling from the very bottom. That's what could happen if Britain were to leave. And of course, the reasons behind this are the hardships brought on by open borders, by immigration, as well as by the impending automation. Pressures are going to build even more once automation really starts to kick in. But it's really the economic issues and the immigration issues that we're seeing. Now, an important development has been happening in the last week. We've seen a massive shift in the polls in terms of people uh, supporting Britain leaving. And we've had the largest circulation paper in the UK, The Sun, come out with an editorial yesterday. They said, we are about to make the biggest political decision of our lives, and The Sun urges everyone to vote leave. We must set ourselves free from dictatorial Brussels. And they go on to say, our 43-year membership in the European Union has proved increasingly greedy. The European Union has proved uh, greedy, wasteful, bullying, and breathtakingly incompetent in crisis. They say outside the EU, we can become richer, safer, and free at long last to forge our own destiny as America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and many other great democracies already do. And of course, that's the issue. Will we continue to consolidate power? That is an issue of individual liberty. We see as power is taken away from the individual and given to the state, even at local government, we are diminished as individuals. And then it goes from the local government to the community, to the state level, to the national level. Once it goes to the global level, we are going to have very little freedom. We're not gonna have any control over even our national economy at that point. And that's what we're seeing from these trade deals, which are the next step. So this is the way to stop this. It's very interesting. They go on to say in their editorial, staying in will be far worse for immigration. It'll be far worse for jobs. It'll be worse for wages, worse for our way of life. Greece is bankrupt. Italy is in danger of going the same way. In Spain, 45% of those under 25 are out of work. And to back that up, take a look at this article here. Spain's public debt 
has now surpassed 100% in a 20-year high. Spain's public debt rose over the 100% level in the first quarter to its highest level in 20 years, said the central bank. Debt as a proportion of economic output at 100.5% in the first quarter, up from 99.2% at the end of 2005. Now, what is happening is we're seeing a massive political movement even in Spain, where the left has pretty much had a monopoly since uh, Francisco Franco was overturned, the uh, fascist dictator. Uh, for the last 21 out of 39 years, the left has ruled in Spain without any competition, but that is now being challenged. Why? Now, the Financial Times points out that Spain offers a textbook example of the travails that have befallen the center left, the ones who have ruled it. Only 18% of the people there identify themselves as conservatives, and yet the socialists are losing power. Why? They say in Spain and elsewhere in Europe, voters have come to associate the center left with many of the unpopular policies traditionally championed by the right. Austerity, deregulation, liberalization, free trade. The party of the welfare state, of the public sector, of the blue-collar worker has turned its back on all three. They saw their jobs disappear by the millions, yet there was no one around to even articulate their fear or their anger or their frustration. In other words, the same thing that we're seeing here in America. When you get frustrated with the uh, Republicans, you continue to vote for uh, some control over the borders. You continue to vote for Obamacare to be repealed. Or the left continues to vote for their issues, and nobody is paying any attention to them. Why? Because it is about global consolidation, and they're working for their masters. You know, it is about immigration. It is about automation. And it's what they were talking about at Bilderberg when they were concerned about the precariat. Of course, that's the Marxist economist looking at the proletariat, breaking people into these competing classes, and then saying, these are people who are in a precarious position. And of course, why are they in a precarious position? Because of these same policies that we're seeing here in America. That's the rise of Trump, and it's the rise of the disgust with the leftists in Spain. It has nothing to do with the left-right paradigm. That is a phony paradigm. It's about whether or not we're going to be controlled by others or whether or not we're going to have control over our own lives, whether or not we're going to lose our jobs and become uh, kept pets of the globalists. Now, when they're talking about the Brexit, I find it interesting that we've got a fear campaign that's being put out by the globalists, by the crony capitalists, by the bankers, but the people who are saying we need to leave have actually put out a very concrete program. We've seen, uh, and this is one of the, uh, one, some of the actions that they're talking about that they could have. For example, they're saying they could abolish 5% uh, VAT tax on household energy bills. Just get rid of that. So if you get out of the European Union, we can just take off this 5% tax on all the energy that you use. How would that be paid for? Oh, well, it would be paid for by the money that they save by not sending it to the European Union. Hmm. National Health Service, okay? That's their uh, nationalized health care. They say the NHS would receive a 100 million pound per week real-term cash transfusion. Oh, that would also be paid for by savings when they leave the European Union. That's about $150 million a week in American terms that they would going to their health care program. Talking about immigration, they would say they would end the automatic right of EU citizens to enter the United Kingdom. They say they would also restore the UK government's power to control its own trade policy. And they would repeal the European Communities Act. Okay, they say they'll cease to form a part of the UK law and the European court's jurisdictions over the UK will end. In other words, their laws are being made by the European court. They're paying an excessive amount of money to the European Union that will go to their own social programs. And so they have been very clear about the policies that they would pursue. Now, the people who are opposing Britain leaving the European Union are trying to create a campaign of fear. And one of the things that they're doing is saying, this is nothing but a leap in the dark. We don't know where we're going to go. And yet they do have a roadmap. And they are calling, they said, we need to have uh, people from uh, business, from the legal community, from civil society to join together. We need to talk about how we're going to save money, how we're going to take back control of our lives. They call for immediate legislation in the current session of parliament to end the European Court of Justice's control over national security, to allow the government to deport criminals from the uh, European Union. They say, after we vote leave, the public needs to see that there's an immediate action to take back control from the European Union. That's the key thing. That's what we've been talking about. And of course, it was a couple of weeks ago that I played the eight reasons 
from Boris Johnson, where he talked about all the uh, things that could be accomplished once they left the European Union, the money that they could save, the control that they would have, how they would not be getting all of these regulations as well as laws and have the European courts controlling their lives. And I point out all of those things apply to every one of the states in the Union, especially to Texas. Texas would save even more money than Britain would if we left the United States. So that is something for us to all think about as we look at this, as we look at the fear campaign, as the bankers and the current government leaders who are pushing for globalism tell them that it's going to be outright economic, and in some cases they've actually threatened physical war, actual war on, in Europe if they leave the European Union. This is a time for the Brits to say, are they going to cave into these kinds of threats like Neville Chamberlain did, or are they going to stand up to it like Winston Churchill did? And it's a time for us to say, are we going to continue to go down this path of consolidation? Or are we going to say that we're going to take back our lives, take back control of our economy, and take our liberty back from these people who are using every excuse to take it? That is the key that is before us. That is the key decision as we look at the gun controllers saying it's not about borders, it's simply about gun control. We can make you safe if we take away your guns if you're on our super secret list. All right, stay with us when we come back. We're going to talk about some technology issues. The latest story is NASA has a new mission. It's not now to make Muslims feel good about themselves. Now they're talking about human clones on Mars. Yeah, eugenics, chimera. Okay, we'll be right back. The Federal Reserve is a private banking cartel. The yeah, Fed is a sometimes very independent uh, organization. What should be the proper relationship between the chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? The Federal Reserve is an independent agency. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Welcome back. We're going to talk about NASA's plans to grow body parts on Mars in just a moment. But uh, before we get to that tech news, uh, we have a new article that's come out at Infowars.com by Mikhail Phelan. Hacker has released the secret Clinton documents from the State Department uh, DNC's Trump opposition file and their donor list. A slew of things have come out. Now, of course, we reported yesterday, it was widely reported, the DNC admitted, hey, we've been hacked because they knew this was coming. We now have this hacker taunting the security organization, CrowdStrike. Uh, they say, uh, well, worldwide known cybersecurity company CrowdStrike announced that the DNC's servers had been hacked by quote unquote sophisticated hacker groups. He says, well, I'm very pleased that the company appreciated my skills so highly, but in fact, it was very, very easy. He said, shame on you, CrowdStrike. Do you think I've been in the DNC's network for almost a year and saved only two documents? Do you really believe that? Here's just a few of the documents from the thousands that I extracted when hacking the DNC's network. Now, what he has shown is a 211-page opposition research file on Donald Trump. In other words, this is the battle plans of the DNC and Hillary Clinton. How are they going to come after Donald Trump? That's been released now in the open. The next thing that was released down in the open is a long list of multiple donors, okay, includes high-profile names like Hollywood actor Morgan Friedman and director Steven Spielberg. And it says, uh, although DNC chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz said no financial documents were compromised, the hacker says, nonsense, just look at this list of donors. And then most interestingly, they say uh, they've got HRC, Hillary Rodden Clinton's election plans, and national security transition plannings. The hacker says, all these documents, including those currently unpublished, have been given to WikiLeaks. So there's actually a document in there that was marked secret, you know, because she just doesn't care about the classified documents. And yet everything we do in this country, now apparently even the Second Amendment is going to be sacrificed national security. But Hillary Clinton is not going to be held accountable for that. Now we've been told in the past, remember it's back in 2010, Barack Obama's uh, NASA director said, you know, my, my primary mission is to make Muslims feel good about their contributions to science. Well, now they've got a new top priority. Their new top priority seems to be uh, human cloning in space and a very creepy project that they have launched with some very disturbing implications, quite frankly. Now, that's reported by the UK Express. They say, could people one day be cloned in outer space? It's launched a competition for scientists to create a thick and functional skin tissue that could survive off-planet. 
They're working with the Methuselah Foundation. This is all about eugenics, folks, okay? This is where the globalists want to go. They want to set up their colonies in space that we've talked about. This is the ultimate Agenda 21. As Bezos said, he's going to zone the Earth for residential. No, that would be actually for slave quarters, if you really want to know what's going to happen with it, okay? It's like the Ardalek War that Hugo de Garris talked about. But the Methuselah Foundation, where these people are going to get eternal life, they're going to live uh, up in the... Uh, uh, space colonies. They say uh, the Methuselah Foundation's new organ alliance. They're going to investigate how to improve bioengineering through a competition called the Vascular Tissue Challenge. They say the results of the competition will not only be beneficial to space exploration, but it's expected to revolutionize healthcare on Earth as well. Yeah, it'll revolutionize eugenics, chimeras, and genetically modified humans. And they even have a disclaimer in the last uh, paragraph. There are fears that creating artificial tissue will lead to body parts and eventually full-blown human cloning. You think? Of course it will. That's their plan. And on this day, we see SpaceX, that is Elon Musk's uh, space program, his private corporation, part of the billionaire space race. We now see that they were successful in launching a couple of communication satellites, but as the rocket booster came back down to Earth to land on the floating barge, it exploded. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not the right word to use. This is how they describe it. It experienced an RUD, a rapid unscheduled disassembly. <laughs> a rapid unscheduled. See, that's <laughs> when his rocket blows up, you know, a little two-year-old will look at it and say, mm, rocket go boom. No, he says it had a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Okay, it wasn't a failure. It wasn't a failure, not at all. How did he get the, author the power to uh, launch these satellites? Well, you know, it's interesting because he went to John McCain and he greased the guy up with some campaign contributions. Uh, he uh, gave him, he invested $350,000 in fees to a high-powered lobbying firm to promote McCain's defense spending bill. He then contributed $5,000 to McCain's re-election campaign fee. This is reported by The New American. And thousands more to the McCain Institute. What did he get for that? Well, he got the monopoly, essentially, on launching satellites for the government. That's what really was happening today. It was not just uh, his rocket that's blowing up. It's our, our money that's blowing up there. McCain, for his part, helped Musk's company, SpaceX, get a government contract to launch military intelligence satellites into space. And McCain proposed an amendment that nearly made SpaceX's only other competitor ineligible to compete for that contract. See, we've seen that over and over again. Hewlett Packard did that in Israel when they were creating the biometric scanning stuff for their wall to control people coming in and out of their country. Guess what? Hewlett Packard went in and greased the appropriate people and they made sure that all of the other competitors, there was about a dozen competitors, they were all disqualified from bidding on that project. That is a common thing. But what is not common is the degree to which Elon Musk has become the ultimate crony capitalist. This article from the New American, they also point out what happened in Nevada. They say Nevada is a good example. He went in and he's going to set up the Gigafactory to create these new generations of batteries. And so this is going to be a great thing for whatever states get into it. So they had multiple states competing for them, offering him, begging him massive amounts of money. Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Nevada. Nevada was the one who won. They were the lucky winners. Nevada taxpayers can give Elon Musk $1.3 billion for that one company. But don't worry. He's going to create 6,500 jobs. You know how much that is per job? That's $200,000 per job that the Nevada taxpayers are paying for that. Now, the LA Times has looked at it and said, oh, $1.3 billion? That's nothing. Elon Musk has gotten $4.9 billion in government subsidies. Uh, it's not just that company. It's also Tesla. It's also SolarCity, SpaceX. Others are all getting massive infusions of money from the government. As uh, Zero Hedge points out, he is, Elon Musk is the king of crony capitalism. He says, you know all those Tesla cars that everybody's so excited about and how competitive they are? Well, that's not really the true cost of the car. He said those cars are heavily subsidized uh, with government credits. As a matter of fact, on the manufacturing end, Tesla got 1.3, besides the $1.3 billion that they got uh, out of the state of Nevada, they're also getting carbon credits that are being paid by companies that really do manufacture cars. Laws in nine states, including California, require automakers who sell real cars to buy offsetting carbon credits. Those carbon credits are then used to subsidize Elon Musk's electric cars. And so it goes. And what we're going to see 
is we're going to see these people who are creating these electric cars, who are creating the autonomous cars, this connection that they have, these crony capitalists who control government are going to control our transportation. And they're going to be able to shut you down, put you on not only a no-fly list, but a no-drive list. And they're going to be able to do that without due process, just like they can confiscate your guns. Take a look at this story from the Daily Mail. They point out, uh, well, you know, we've all heard this, we've all said this to our kids, I'm not your personal taxi driver. They looked at the number of miles a typical British parent does, uh, what we would call in the United States being a soccer mom. And they said, well, it works out to about... Uh, 15,000 pounds a year, that'd be about $22,500. In London, it's about double that, okay? It's about $45,000. And they say, that's what it would cost if you had a taxi. But, you know, we're told, don't worry, because we're not going to have to have cars. We're going to have taxis. Is it cheaper for you to drive your own car? Is it cheaper to drive a taxi? Of course, a taxi is far more expensive. But the head of Uber says, well, what makes a taxi expensive is that dude and the car. We're going to get rid of him. They're going to be self-driving. And we're only going to have about 15 cents per mile is going to be our cost. Let me ask you how long you think that's going to last when he's got a monopoly. There is a Bloomberg technology conference going on in San Francisco. And this is some of the stuff that they're saying, the pre presenters there who are talking about it uh, from Uber. Uh, one of the guys who is uh, a director there at Uber says, driverless is basically a disruptive wave in our rearview mirror right now. That's not a situation where the technology is going to be evenly distributed. It's going to be very proprietary. And if somebody can build a driverless car, they're going to have a massive economic advantage if they employ that fleet at scale, especially if they have the government helping them to maintain a monopoly. He says driverless cars, as part of their mission statement, says driverless cars are in alignment with the company's mission to provide reliable transportation to everyone everywhere. See, Uber means Uber Ollie's. Uber Ollie's transportation. They will control all the transportation. And guess what? They're not going to give you economic pricing. They're going to give you monopoly pricing. Well, that's it for today's news. Join us again tomorrow at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.